Hi, everyone. Hi. So uh, this presentation is on the phenomenology and sequelae of MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. Um, not sure if you all know what those words mean, so I'll start off by defining a couple of them. Uh, phenomenology, which I'll go into more detail about later, uh, basically means uh, the lived experience in this context. And uh, sequelae, um, here, Whoa. okay, there we go. It's looking into the, the impact of the experience. So I want to know about the experience, the lived experience of participants and the impact um, of those who've been in MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. Now, I don't know you all, and I've never presented this in this sort of situation before, so I'd actually like to start with something a little unconventional. Um, I want to hear from you. I want to hear why you're here, um, what you're interested in on this topic, um, and any questions you might have so that I can guide my presentation a little bit. Um, so if anyone has anything to say up front, I'd love to hear it. Um, yeah, right there. Okay, great. Um, yes, right here. I just wanted to see, since I, I'm very familiar with the motor research, I don't know if it's part of research, if there are any similarities or differences. I'm just curious. Okay. I'll repeat it for you. Um, she's interested in the similarities and differences from the, the MAPS uh, middle effort <laughs> research that's currently happening right now. Um, and someone else was just interested in poten potentially participating and wanted to know a little bit more about the experience and its impact. Um, over here. Okay, so someone interested in how this might help patients at the end of life. Um, yeah, back there. Okay, so someone interested in the process of qualitative phenomenological study and what the method and design looks like. Um, yes? What sort of patient population from your research do you think can best benefit from MDMA-type therapy? Okay, so the patient population that might benefit from this, and that might be something we'll talk about in the conclusions. Um, yeah, right there. Yeah, I'm interested in the uh, effectiveness on trauma, PTSD. Okay, so how it might help with trauma, and uh, right here. I'm curious as to the, the actual interaction, so during the effect of the drug, how, what is the intervention being done that causes the effect of outcome? Okay, so, so what specifically in the process of therapy itself, um, what intervention done by the therapist might help to facilitate that process? Um, okay, let's stop there. Um, thanks, everyone, and that will, I'll try to keep that in mind as I move forward. Uh-oh, come back. <laughs> Okay, there we go. All right, so we're looking at the lived experience and the impact um, of MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. Actually, let's go back to this really quickly so I can map out for you what, um, what information I have. Um, so over here on the tree to the right, we've got the context, um, and I got have some information about the context. Um, which I might skim through pretty briefly, if at all, because I didn't hear any questions about that, and you can get that in other places. Um, you probably have gotten a lot of it this weekend already. Uh, I also have the method and design, and I can go through that. There is at least a little bit of interest there. Um, and then uh, the summary and conclusions, I'm going to hold off on, hold off until the end to talk about. Um, I'll then move to the trends down here that I noticed. Um, and then finally, we'll look more in depth at the themes, what came up uh, in my research. Okay, so let's get started. All 
right, so the context. This one's going to be quick and brief. Uh, why don't you just take a look at that? Maybe notable that MDMA was first synthesized by a German pharmaceutical company called Merck in 1912. They were looking for a blood clotting agent, um, and they patented it as an intermediate compound. Uh, it was then tested on animals uh, by the Ar U.S. Army looking for a brainwashing agent, apparently, so they say. Um, and then first ingested by Sasha Shulkin in 1976. Um, he described it as an easily controlled altered state of consciousness with emotional and sensual overtones. Uh, he saw great potential in it and introduced it to his therapist friends around the area. Uh, after it went uh, illegal in 1985, uh, many of those therapists stopped using the drug, and some went underground, meaning that they continued to use it but tried to be very discreet about it. Um, it's that population that I'll be studying. Um, yeah, you've heard about the existing research. <laughs> A lot of it is... Uh, the rigorous, methodologically sound research is really just showing up recently through maps. Earlier on, it was more case reports, descriptions, um, that sort of thing, questionnaires, that sort of thing, which gave us a lot of data, um, but maybe uh, less specific quantitative results. Research claims. This is important because this is what inspired the, the research that I ended up doing. Um, I was really intrigued by the potential of MDMA, both from my own experiences and also from what I was reading. Um, uh, some say it has the potential to facilitate enduring psychological healing, that it's safe and efficacious in treating treatment-resistant trauma patients. You've probably heard a bit about that this weekend. Um, that it, This part's important, that it inhibits the fear response while enhancing trust, safety, emotional engagement, and recall of difficult memories. Uh, and that combination of effects they say puts the participant in what they call the optimal arousal zone in which to process trauma. Um, they also say it allows participants to view themselves, their defenses, and their dysfunctional patterns with greater accuracy and objectivity. And finally, that it accelerates the therapeutic process. Okay, moving on to method and design. Uh, the goals of my study were to investigate the therapeutic potential of the drug as an adjunct to therapy. Uh, to gain full, rich descriptions of the lived experiences of MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. Uh, that uh, has not really been done um, so much in a, in a more comprehensive, qualitative way. Um, I think that maybe some of it is, is starting to happen with maps, um, through maps. But um, And finally, to explore the participants' experiences of the long-term effects of MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. And there's very little research on that right now because the map studies are so new. Okay, so my method. Uh, I used qualitative research, um, which is looking to understand and describe the lived experiences um, through the perspectives of the participants themselves. Um, and there's many different types of qualitative research. I chose one called phenomenology. It's been described as a rigorous descriptive approach interested in understanding the essence of experiences as they present themselves to consciousness. Um, it's really looking at uh, how do people describe and experience uh, an event. And there's an assumption behind that, that you can get to the essence of that event by listening to and sifting down the essence of their descriptions. So um, that, that you can kind of get to the bottom of it through these subjective accounts. Uh, my design, this is a sort of brief uh, summary of it, but um, recruitment was understandably hard. These participants are difficult to access. It's um, illegal. What they're doing is illegal, and so they're not quick to uh, want to share their experiences. Um, and there just aren't that many people who've done it. So I used a method called convenience sampling, which basically means reaching out to any organizations and people that I thought might have access to these sorts of participants. And uh, Eventually, I was able to recruit five. Um, five is not an ideal number. It's pretty small, um, but that was just due to the limited resources and time that I had. Uh, so there were five participants, um, one male and four females, ages 30 to 46. Um, 
they'd participated in an MDMA session anywhere from three to eight years ago. I left uh, the window pretty open. I said anywhere between two and 25, but that was what came up. Um, and I, let's see, three of them had only participated in one session, and then two had participated in at least two, if not three, and potentially got, gone on to do uh, psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy as well. Um, I conducted semi-structured interviews. I had 10 questions asking participants about um, what their experience was going into the experience, where they were in their life, what they were looking for, um, what the experience itself was like, um, what the aftermath was like, and then how they perceived the impact. If, if they thought it had an impact, how they perceived it. Um, and then a semi-structure just means I had follow-up questions um, if it seemed important. I audio recorded and transcribed the interviews, and then I used a process called thematic analysis to um, go through all of the data. I had a team of uh, two coders. Come back. Uh, so there are two coders, and in addition to myself, and we sifted through all of the data and picked out the uh, sort of the themes, the things we thought were particularly relevant, and. Um, and then I found the consensual themes, meaning those that showed up in at least two, usually three different interviews. And those I turned into, oh, I'll tell you about that in a second. <laughs> um, limitations, just quickly run through this. Small sample size, obviously, so I call this a pilot study. Um, the underground nature of the therapy could have led to uh, you know, a number of problems, including it. Most importantly, does this represent MDMA psychotherapy as a whole? Maybe not. Um, the fact that it was retrospective self-report, so people were talking about experiences in the past, memory is not always 100% accurate. And then the variability of contextual factors, which I'll tell you about in a, a bit, but basically their experiences of, the experiences of these five participants turned out to be uh, very uh, different uh, from one another. Um, We'll talk more about that as we look at the themes. Um, let's see, do I wanna, I'd like to actually skip through this quickly and just show you a table of the themes. Okay, so I came up with 30 different themes organized into four temporal categories. We have leading up to the MDMA session, during the MDMA session, short-term sequelae, and long-term sequelae. Um, I'll talk more about these, so. You can just look at it briefly, and then I'll go into him. In terms of that variability that I explained earlier, um, there turned out to be two, two major trends, where typically with phenomenology, you're looking for one essence. Um, here, I wasn't able to do that, but instead came up with two essences or trends or patterns or stories of what the experience might be like. So here they are, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through them one at a time. I'm going to read a kind of narrative storyline that I wrote about these experiences because I think it describes them in a pretty descriptive way. So first, what was in common? Uh, both hypothetical participants go into the experience struggling in their life, feeling stuck, and unable to address these issues in psychotherapy. They have experience with psychedelics, and when they hear about the opportunity to participate in MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, they have high hopes that this will lead to some kind of breakthrough. They also have some anxiety going into the experience. Hypothetical participant A, so that's this one here, uh, the combination of participants two, three, and five spends time with her therapist preparing for the session and developing a strong therapeutic alliance. She's told what to expect from the experience and instructed to take good care of herself before and after the session. She and her therapist come up with goals or intentions for the work. She's supported in checking in with herself to ensure that she feels comfortable participating. After ingesting MDMA, she feels suddenly taken over by its effects. She perhaps feels some resistance at first and if so is guided back into her internal experience. She feels aware of her body perhaps experiencing heat, 
temperature fluctuations, and a desire to move, dance, or be touched. She experiences a profound sense of clarity, empathy, self-acceptance, and openness to others. She does some work involving music, writing, intentions, or photographs. This triggers intense emotion, both pleasurable and challenging, and regression to an earlier experience of trauma. The therapist supports her through these feelings, and she is able to process this experience and the related emotions. Ultimately, she comes to some deeper understanding of her experience and develops a new trauma narrative. The next day, her body feels physically drained, so she relaxes and takes good care of herself. She experiences a sense of peace and clarity. In therapy, she and her therapist work to integrate the MDMA session and find ways to carry the experience into her daily life. She feels that she has come to a resolution about some of the issues with which she's been struggling. She's gained some insight about her life and has a more empathic perspective and places a higher value on self-care. Her sense of self may have shifted towards greater self-acceptance and self-awareness, and she feels more grounded in her body. She may find herself making life changes, letting go of relationships that no longer serve her, and transforming others. She feels closer to her therapist. She also now has a greater respect for the drug. She knows that it has the power to bring about intense emotions, as well as profound healing. She, therefore, is more cautious about using it recreationally. So that's our first participant, first trend that I found. Here's the second. Hypothetical participant B does not feel particularly safe or comfortable with her therapist, and there are some transference issues between them that have not been discussed. Transference, FYI, is the basically feelings, emotions, reactions, projections that the client has towards the therapist. Uh, they briefly prepare for the MDMA session, but the participant does not have a good sense of what to expect or how to prepare herself personally and has not put much thought into whether this is really the right decision for her. After ingesting the MDMA, she feels the drug take her over, and this triggers a lot of anxiety. She does not feel safe or supported by the therapist and finds herself talking a lot without making sense. She has some moments of clarity and self-acceptance, but also feels moments of shame and self-criticism. She's concerned that the therapist is judging her, uncomfortable, or just bored. While looking at pictures, she begins to feel intense emotion related to past trauma. She spends some time processing it internally, but does not feel that the therapist supports or guides this process. And eventually, she finds herself distracting herself by dancing and listening to music. After the session, she feels profoundly disappointed and is in a generally gloomy mood. She can still sense the feelings that arose in the session, yet feels unable to address or work through them. Instead, she becomes restless and avoidant, engaging in a lot of compulsive behavior. In her therapy sessions thereafter, she does not feel she can express her disappointment, and she does not find that the therapist provides helpful insight or direction. She ends up distancing herself from her therapist. She feels she has gained some level of insight and a shift in perspective from the experience. Still, from this point on, she is very careful about the context of her drug use, having experienced the intense feelings it can bring up and the challenging impact it can have on her mood and well-being. Okay. So now we can get into the themes. I'm noticing we don't have a lot of time to do that. Um, so I'm going to pull them up one at a time and then read you some excerpts. This is maybe the juicy part of the presentation, so I hope we can do a little bit of that. Um, first, before the MDMA session. You can read those if you like while I, I read a little bit about what the participants themselves said about it. Um, so one, this is... This is one of the participant Bs, so the one who had a harder time. I was like, I don't think I want to touch it. Clearly, it was some very ripe territory, but I was reluctant, so I kind of went into it with trepidation. So super nervous, and um, yeah, super nervous about it. I was like, shit, a lot's going to come out. And I wanted to say very, I wanted it very much, but was also really stricken with fear at times thinking about it. Same person. I really expected my therapist to take a much more um, stronger role in the process. 
So we didn't talk about where we would be located in space, how much interaction we'd have. There was like no talk about that. I realized I had made a lot of concessions before we even began, but I felt that was, you know, in exchange for her guidance and her company that I could just burn some fucking sage, big deal. <laughs> so this is, this is that participant B going into the experience. I'll give another one of, um, this is the other version of that participant. Sometimes I don't think through things enough to protect myself or prepare myself. So, like with the shaman, I was like, here I was jumping into this super vulnerable space that I had never really ventured into with basically a stranger. I didn't really check in with myself or wasn't capable of doing that then to kind of know that. And so I guess for me, that's what stood out for me in the journey was just feeling almost like social with the person in a way that I think I'm sure it changed the experience a lot, like not really feeling safe. So I think that's what stands out to me about it and like wishing that I would have gotten to know her more over time, even if I had to meet with her a few more times or whatever it was, because I do think that that definitely impacted how it all went. So in contrast, here's another example from participant A, one of the three in participant A. I trusted following his guidance. It's like, okay, first this is what we do. We just get to know each other. We have some trust and rapport building. And then, about four months into our work, weekly therapy, we got ready for the first MDMA journey. We talked about having a good night's sleep, eating a good, healthy meal the night before, just being really gentle with myself before the work. I asked all my questions, got my concerns answered, learned about the side effects, prepared for it, took calcium magnesium before and after, and kind of checked it out. Does it still feel right for me to do it? It was a very grounded experience to prepare like that journal writing, creating intentions, creative intentions. I just remember thinking, okay, I'm going to go inside and pray and surrender and trust. That was the guidance from the therapist. Okay, the psyche is going to show you whatever it wants to show you, and can you also surrender? Like you put out your intentions and then throw them into the wind because your psyche is going to show you what it needs to show you. Okay, so you can see the sharp contrast between those two forms of preparation for this experience. Here's the themes from during the MDMA experience. And yeah, I'll read some quotes from that as well. Here we're, we're talking about participant B again. And so looking at the black and white photos of us, I just was so, I wasn't angry at her, but I was really sad and just asking all these questions out loud. And then I cried a little and then rolled around under the blankets a little and then came out and said I had a realization. I could, I could almost vividly picture or experience the conversation she, and she is this participant's mom, by the way, had with me right before, before I was even born in the womb. So I had that experience, and it felt very real. I mean, the fact that I was suddenly privy to a conversation she'd had with me while I was in the womb, it was liberating in the sense that I was like, oh, shit, I just discovered something having to do with a story, and it felt important but I don't feel that my therapist really buoyed up that momentary revelation and took it in a direction where it could have, even, could have been even more useful and potent. She kind of let me do my own thing around that. I think because I recall not being able to keep my attention on any one thing or thought or idea for too long before the music would take me away again, which I was so thankful for. So I remember being pretty much left to my own devices and going back to the pictures and then pushing them away. And then, you know, being a little girl again and trying to work through some of the early events of my life. And she didn't, there was no physical touching, which I realized was unfortunate. But I guess, you know, she had to comply to certain rules of engagement. But I don't think those were ever explicitly mentioned, like I said before. So it kind of struck me as a little odd for the intimacy of our relationship and the setting. It was, I was like, oh man, I'm not going to be touched. That's kind of shitty. <laughs> So I kind of had to pack things away again and kind of just self, what's the word? Self-contain in a way. Um, I'm going to give a, a different experience or a different portrayal of the other version of participant B. Very different, also interesting. I think I expected it to feel really good and instead I felt really bad. And I was really, I was shocked. I couldn't believe how anxious I was. I felt like a crazy, like an insane person who had just snorted like tons of cocaine or something. Like a crackhead. It was crazy, the anxiety. I remember feeling a lot of shame because I didn't know her very well. Not having worked with her, I know her more. Now, having worked with her, I know her more, so I don't feel ashamed of what happens or comes up. But I definitely felt like really ashamed of just how nutty I was. 
because I was because I kind of knew how nutty I was. I felt like a paranoid. I was looking at these photos and I was like, don't you see? And kind of projecting all these things onto the photos about my family dynamic. And just felt like the blabber and just felt like blabbering in a way. In the beginning, I got this lucid information like I was telling you about, but then it just felt like all this blabber that didn't really make sense and was kind of nonlinear. And I feel like it was almost all this noise in my head that was just extracted or something like that. Okay. And in contrast, All of a sudden, I looked at these photographs and I just saw all these people in my life in a completely different way. I saw how I really felt about them and I saw, as I thought at the time, I saw how they really saw me. I mean, how I really think they see me, but at a deeper level, how I perceive what's going on with my primary projections all over it, without my primary projections all over it. And so I really saw into all these relationships way deeper. I saw my father's love for me for the first time. I saw it as very unexpressed in him. Another one. I went fully inside. I crawled to the mat, went inside, and did not come out much at all. I really went in. And what really came up for me was all sorts of stuff about my infant self, possibly even before, like my pre-birth self. It was really profound. So I think I surrendered and went in, and then I had this beautiful experience of making peace with that time. And it just was really very informative. It was like the medicine was working on my whole body, and just, and all I could do was surrender. I really went way inside with that. So this idea that I'm going to work on something, I had to surrender and just let it happen to me. Yeah, my agendas, I really did surrender and just let the medicine do its work. All right, here's the short-term sequela. So this is, um, you know, in the, in the aftermath, the time immediately after the session. Um, here's our participant B again. I was just again like rife with a bunch of unspoken feelings and things, and I was super, super sensitive the days following, probably for a good week. I kind of wanted to be left alone, and I didn't talk to family. I didn't, I talked to my partner, but just barely. So he was upset, and sh so shit sucked. <laughs> yeah, I felt like, oh, there are those feelings that I often have, and I know can tell a great story, and they still felt like on the verge of me really feeling them. They're kind of like, you know, on that demarcation line between like being able to easily push them back again. Um, I was a little upset with my therapist and I was kind of holding that. And I eventually did tell her, like during our next session, that you know, it wasn't, I don't even know what the word is now to describe it, but it just wasn't. And that I was really hoping she would be more of like a figure of some sort and that she'd let me, that she'd led me to believe or I'd somehow led myself to believe that it would be a lot more playful and co cooperative. So I kept seeing her, but I was, you know, knowing that she was going to leave in a few months and all that jazz, I was sort of wrapping it up without her, kind of personally, psychically. I was sort of like, all right, let's just go through the last few bullet points so we feel like there's some kind of, you know, container here, some semblance of closure. Um, in contrast to... So the integration was in the following week. We set up a time when we were back in the regular psychotherapy office and we had a meeting where we kind of processed what happened, what showed up, what were some of the challenges, what were the struggles, and what was, I don't know what that says. So it was a really great thing to put it all together and say, okay, what's the point of this? How am I gonna bring it into my life? So it was very rich, those meetings, the follow-up, because something happened and it was both of them. Something occurred and it's like, okay, how to bring the pearls with me as opposed to that was a trip. Okay, and finally, the long-term sequelae or impact. Um, participant B, the sort of dismay that I was left with after it made it kind of peppered everything around me. I was kind of like, for a bunch of years afterwards. I was disappointed with myself because I felt like I had been given such an awesome opportunity with the MDMA and the supervision and, you know, the intention behind the whole thing. And somehow I missed it. Like, I missed it, you know? Like, I felt it coming, and it was so good. You know, like, remembering how to stretch my arms in that space was, like, foretold such bounty. But then it never happened in those next few hours or after. So I was disappointed with what I thought was a personal inability to grab the opportunity to make some real shift. So I was sitting with that for a few years afterwards. 
in contrast to, let's see, let's do, ever since then, this is another participant in the, the first category. Ever since then, I've had this ability to see into people. It's really stuck in the sense that now I describe it as a gift that I have. Other people do too. It really shifted my sense of self. And I have a better sense of the dynamics, my dynamics with my family. And it didn't really change that much, not just from the session, but it helped me see that, see what was going on more clearly. I was able to name some things with my brother and sister. And it's a piece of the transformation in my relationship with my parents. And within other relationships, being able to see them more clearly. I, I also feel a little different in my somatic relationship with the world. My shoulders are a little more open. My chest's a little more open. I'm looking a little bit more forward. Not all the time, but I'm aware of that, and I'm like that more of the time. Okay. Oh, and this is important, too. From what it looks like to me in my experience, with a deeper relationship with the therapist, you can go way deeper in the session, even if you don't talk to them at all. Because in the session, I really didn't talk to the therapist very much. Most of it was just internal, but she was there keeping me safe and available for me any way I needed. Afterward, we talked about the session a lot and the things that came up. We were trying to figure out what they meant, what they're about and their relevance. And yeah, I think the level of trust, the strength of the therapeutic alliance, the bond, whatever you want to call it, chemistry with each other, I think it had a huge impact on how deep I was able to go. Okay, so it looks like we might have to breeze through the summary and conclusions there. We're on break now, I think, officially, but I'll keep going until someone stops me. <laughs> so, on the bright side, some of the participants found that, um, and this is sort of in response to the, the research claims that we read about earlier, um, MDMA can be a useful therapeutic tool with the potential to deepen and accelerate the therapeutic process. It can enhance empathy, openness, acceptance, and clarity while decreasing defensiveness during the session. And the experience can lead to longer-term resolution, insight, life changes, a new perspective and sense of self, and an altered experience of the drug. But it's really important to note that participants may be in a vulnerable position going into the session. Many of the, the participants I talked to were struggling. They were using MDMA as a last resort. They tried other things, and it hadn't worked for them. They had high hopes that this would really help, and they were experiencing a lot of anxiety going into it. Um, that's a vulnerable population right there. Also, MDMA seems to amplify the intrapsychic and interpersonal dynamics that existed before the session. So as we saw with at least one of those clients, um, she had some issues with her therapist that were really amplified in their MDMA session. I have hypotheses about that that I won't go into right now, but... Yeah, there were certainly some transference issues that hadn't been addressed. Um, and finally, MDMA can trigger traumatic memories and regressive experiences. Um, and <laughs> intense emotions and traumatic memories are likely to arise and may be experienced as quite challenging. Um, so in the context of a safe and trusting environment, like we saw with participant A, these can be processed and integrated, leading to healing and resolution. On the other hand, without adequate preparation and trust, the experience of intense emotion may lead to anxiety, overwhelm, or avoidance during the session and symptoms of depression and anxiety thereafter. So finally, what this, the sort of clinical implications that this has for therapists who might do this in the future, for participants who might go into it, and you know, potentially for the studies that are occurring right now. Um, very important to put efforts into preparation, letting the clients know what to expect, um, how to personally prepare, set intentions, um, respond to their questions and concerns, uh, maybe give them some literature on it, and really do a check-in to make sure it feels right for these people before they go into it. Um, I think this is, you know, this came out really loud and clear from what I read. Um, also that the therapeutic alliance is, is vital. Um, so a number of meetings are important to develop a sense of safety. <clears throat> One of the participants um, who had a difficult experience had only met with her therapist once beforehand. Um, and that caused a lot of issues in the session. Also important to discuss any transference issues and ruptures that might come up. Um, that seems to be a major problem in the other um, participants' experience. Um, being attentive to the client during the session, which, you know, seems obvious, but um, doesn't apparently happen all the time. 
um, and guiding them back towards their inner experience, which I imagine you've heard some from, from the MAP studies, um, that that's a major part of their process, is just going back to the inner experience of the client. Um, uh, and finally, that trust is not a given. And this, I think, is actually maybe in contrast to some of the, the research and literature that's out there now, and so I'd like to highlight it. Um, what I'm hearing in, in some of the MAP studies is that uh, MDMA enhances trust. And what I'm finding here is that it enhances trust sometimes, if that's already there or if there's energy and time put into it. Um, but if there's any level of distrust or um, kind of unspoken issues happening in the relationship, it might actually enhance distrust. And I think that's really important for us to think about um, in these future studies um, and in any work that happens in the future. And finally, that the integration experience is also really important to carry the work forward, um, to review experiences and insights, discuss how to carry them into one's life, um, process any lingering emotions that are still there, and address any transference issues that came up. Um, and I guess the last thing I want to say is that I, as sort of a hypothesis that I came up with um, around the intense emotional experience that happens in the MDMA session. And my sense is that when there's safety there and when you can process those emotions, they, you know, the client is able to work through them and potentially integrate them into who they are, um, let go of the intensity of their experience, and um, even create a new narrative around them. On the other hand, if the client doesn't have that sort of support, my sense is that the, the emotions end up a little bit for closer to the surface than they used to be, and so they'll kind of linger under the surface in their, the days, weeks, even years afterwards, and it's that that I think might cause the symptoms of depression and anxiety that you see in some, very few, but in some participants of these studies. Um, so, uh, yeah, just something that will be important to keep in mind. So I'm happy to take questions. We're also out of time, so yeah. So you're asking about um, the sort of symptoms of, of depression or the difficulties that might come up in the next year or so. Yeah, I guess that's what I was trying to articulate, um, was that my sense is that uh, MDMA seems to uh, allow for a deeper connection or contact with emotions and uh, traumatic experiences that were previously kind of repressed, you might say. And so when we gain access to that, uh, it gives us the opportunity to work with it, but if we don't work with it, then we're just left with those emotions a little bit closer to consciousness. Um, and they can, you know, they're, they're going to cause discomfort. I imagine that you, that yeah, if you've explored your unconscious and you know, their repressed emotions, it would be useful. Yeah, absolutely. And so it's not like this is then the, you know, the end of the story. If you have those emotions come up and you can then work with them after the session, I think that that can work just as well as processing them in the session. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, yeah, Kelly's right here. She was one of my other raiders, um, and uh, uh, another woman as well. And we, when issues of disagreement came up, we would talk about it until we came to an agreement. Yeah. Yeah, we tended to feel good about about it once we got there. I don't think anyone ever felt like we were kind of, yeah, not comfortable with it. Yeah. Yeah. To emerge and, but you had two, which I, the way I take it was, you know, that you had the two cases which were, didn't resolve as well and had a lot of issues, um, and the three that were much more successful. Right. Um, Yeah, yeah, 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's funny, funny that you're asking this question because this came up uh, quite a bit in the process of um, working with my dissertation committee um, and questioning whether phenomenology was even the right methodology for this. Um, we wondered whether um, this is an experience that you can even distill into an essence. You know, typically, you phenomenology looks at experiences like anger or... Um, I don't know, contentment, you know, things that are very pure and universal in their experience. So to look at MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, much less the impacts of MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, uh, became a little bit... Um, we, we realized the imperfections there. So the way that I reconciled that is that I use phenomenology as my uh, theoretical theoretical perspective, but thematic analysis as my method. Yeah, yeah, sure. sure. Um, he's, he's asking, asking about, about um, MDMA and entheogens in general as a potential drug for spontaneous healing and remissions. And I'm going to have to say that I'm not an expert in that area at all. Um, in terms of what I came across in the literature, um, not much there, quite honestly. Um, and I, I mostly reviewed uh, literature pertaining to MDMA, so I'm not sure what else is out there with the other entheogens. Um, in this particular study, what there's one participant who you might have heard me talk about um, who described an experience of a spontaneous healing of this long-standing, um, I guess, structural disorder. She'd been born with hip dysplasia and, I guess, had suffered with pain resulting from that for most of her life. And in the experience, she felt that she had gone back to her infancy when she was in a full cast from six months to a year. And she like re-experienced that and felt her bones healing. And then after that, she claimed to be pain-free. Um, and I, this was her session was in 2007. So when I talked to her in 2012, that was still the case. Um, I'm not sure about remission. I don't, actually. Perhaps it's something you might take up. <laughs> yeah, 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 very, very interesting. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Let, Let me tell you a bit a little a little bit about it, but um, there there, there was, was also variance here, um, and. Have you, if you've been to any of the uh, Mithoffer's talks, no, okay. He actually does a good job of explaining exactly what it looks like, and I think that their method is more sound than the ones that I'm, you know, that I came across here. I also, so what I'm going to describe is actually more based on the literature than it is my participants' disclosures, because they didn't tell me a lot about the specifics of the session. Um, so typically, you will have a number of preparation sessions. You'll then meet with your therapist in some comfortable location. A few of these participants went to a cabin in the woods, um, where you'll often do a small ritual around the, the medicine, and then the participant will take the medicine, they'll lie down, they'll be given a blindfold and some headphones with music that either they chose or the therapist chose and they agreed upon. Um, and they'll sort of go inwards for the first half an hour to an hour. Um, after a certain while, maybe an hour, if the participant hasn't come back up, the therapist will check on them and just say, hey, how are you doing? And from then on, it'll be a combination of going into the, sort of having the participant go into their internal experience with blindfolds on, just being with whatever comes up, and then the therapist checking in with them and talking about what's there and potentially even supporting them and going in. You know, if the client is describing uh, a challenging experience, they might support them in going into whatever emotion or bodily experience is associated with it. Um, 
Also, a number of participants described bringing photographs um, and just sort of personal objects, and those might often be looked through to, I don't know, see what they bring up. Um, and after, I don't know, four hours or so, the participant will start to come back to reality, um, to sober up, um, and they'll typically arrange a ride home, or perhaps they can stay in this place for the night. It depends on where it is. So. Let's give a hand to our presenter. Uh.